dear listeners, and welcome to episode 61. If you've been following my podcast for some time now, and if you've been listening to the previous series, you've heard me explore the basics of life, then the history and diversity of life, and then how life interacts together on a large scale to form communities and biomes and stuff like that. After exploring the basics of life, I then went on to explore the anatomy and physiology of the plants, and all of the various lineages within the plant kingdom. With those series now complete, I bring you a new series on a new kingdom, the Kingdom Fungi. Where I explored the plant kingdom in two series, I'll only be giving one series to the Kingdom Fungi. Now, it's not because I have some irrational dislike for fungi. On the contrary, they're fantastical and amazing organisms that define and support life as we know it. It's just that, after looking at the data while planning this series, I realized that I wouldn't necessarily have enough information to make two series worth, that were both fun and informative. There are several reasons for this, all having to do with the specific features of fungus. Now, for example, I had an entire episode dedicated to plant hydration, because water transport in plants is actually pretty complex, and it involves a dedicated vasculature system for water transport. Plant hydration helps fuel photosynthesis, and it keeps the plant structurally upright. There was just a lot of material here. Now for fungus, on the other hand, they don't really have specialized water transporting tissues. I mean, some of them do, they form rhizomorphs, and I'll get into that in a few minutes, but there really isn't a whole lot of stuff to really go into extensive detail on. Fungus largely move water through their bodies via diffusion. I can't really fill a half-hour episode talking about diffusion. I mean, I probably could, it would just be really boring. Secondly, I had a whole series dedicated to the lineages of plants. It was the most recent series, uh, you know, of episodes 55 to 60. Now this was relatively easy because plants can be cleanly divided into five major lineages, and so those five, plus the episode about humans and plants, fit my standard six-episode format really cleanly. It, was, it worked pretty well. But now, the fungus lineages just insist on being overly complex and unwilling to cleanly fit into my format. I mean, there's the Basidiomycota, the Ascomycota, and all the rest of the Holomycota. But these groups, how should I say, don't make for good radio. That's not quite the best metaphor, but I mean to say that it would be tricky to cleanly divide all of the fungal lineages in the same way, in the same five episodes, plus humans and fungus. If I did that, some of the episodes would sound awfully boring and repetitive, as I'd be describing very similar funguses that differ mostly on a chemical level, and it would not make for good entertainment. And I think it would be chemically much too technical, and thus it wouldn't even be effective at being informational or educational, you know, so I, I just want to stay away from that. The reason that I want to say all of this is so that you understand why this series on the Kingdom Fungi is structured the way it is. If you listen to episode 34 on fungus as part of my series on the diversity of life, that episode will be kind of like a rough summary of this entire series. Where in episode 34 I talked briefly about all aspects of fungus, from their physiology to their feeding strategy to their symbiotic and parasitic relationships with other life forms, this series on the Kingdom Fungi will explore all of those topics and more in much, much greater detail. So if you just listened to that episode to get some background information for this series, some of what you hear uh, in these next episodes might sound very familiar. Now, it won't necessarily be repeated word for word, but a lot of the concepts and facts uh, that are presented in episode 34 will certainly be re-examined and re-explored. Now, with all of this tedious housekeeping out of the way, it's time to begin. It's time to dive into the world of fungus, beginning with an exploration of their development and their physiology. Perhaps the most fundamental aspect of fungal physiology is their high surface area to volume ratio. This quality, their high surface area, really defines their ecological role. It defines their life strategies. It defines their morphology and it defines the patterns of growth that fungus express as they age and spread through the soil. This high surface area to volume ratio is achieved through structures called hyphaea. The fungus's body is essentially a wet mass of this hyphaea, 
all dividing and growing and spreading out to find food to dissolve into, uh, into metabolically accessible nutrients. The hyphaea are cylindrical structures. They're extremely thin, and they can grow to become extremely long. You can think of them kind of like strings or threads or fibers that are just 2 to 10 micrometers in diameter. This is roughly the same size or the same scale as your typical bacteria cell. It's extremely small. Much like plants with their apical meristems, cellular division in the hyphaea takes place at the very tip, which allows the hyphaea to creep like a snake through its substrate as it searches for food. Sometimes these tips will split or fork, creating two hyphaea that run parallel to each other. Sometimes they'll grow branches that will shoot off at sharp angles in some other direction. Sometimes one hyphaea may come into contact with another hyphaea, and they'll merge together in a process called anastomosis, or hyphal fusion. Essentially, these growth forms create a tangled mass of hyphaea tissue, which forms the mycelium, or the body of the fungus. I suppose I shouldn't use the term tangled mass, because even though it is a mass, and the hyphaea are certainly tangled and overlapping in their millions, uh, I think that that kind of implies a sense of chaos and disorder that I think does a disservice to the fungi. These masses of hyphaea form networks, extremely sophisticated and complex chemical networks that are called a mycelium or mycelia. Like I said, it's the fungus's body. Each mycelial network is considered one individual fungus. Growing out of the hyphaea, either protrusions coming out at steep angles or altered tips of the hyphaea, are all manner of specialized structures that the fungus uses for getting food, for reproduction, and for fusing and growing together with other hyphaea. Some of these structures include the arbuscules of mycorrhizal fungi, which dig into plant cells in their roots to establish a point of symbiotic nutrient exchange. Or the conidiophores and the phyllides that work as platforms for reproduction, as they're structures that will grow and release spores that create new mycelia through asexual reproduction. However, I'll talk about these particular structures in much greater detail when I get to their respective episodes, on fungal nutrition and fungal reproduction, uh, respectively. I want to explore fungal anastomosis a little more, because it's really interesting, and it creates extremely cool-looking fungal structures, like interweaving, interconnecting veins. The numerous anastomoses between the countless hyphaea also create a hugely interconnected network, where nutrients and hormones and other biochemicals can easily flow from one end of the fungus across its entire body structure, across the entire mycelia, to the other end. In this way, the entire fungus can be made aware of the presence of food, differing levels of pH and salinity, dangerous chemicals, and all sorts of other environmental variables, even though only a few hyphaea may currently be in direct contact with whatever variable it happens to be. So how do these anastomoses form on a chemical level? Well, it's not particularly well understood. Funguses use a variety of different mechanisms to establish these anastomoses, one such method being the pheromones that they use to detect and communicate with nearby hyphaea. The growing tips of the hyphaea produce specialized tubular structures called conidial anastomosis tubes, or CATs, C-A-Ts, and these grow to become bridges between proximate hyphaea. These develop out of structures called conidia, which can take two forms. One of these conidia forms is for asexual reproduction. As I said, it produces spores, and these can form new mycelia through asexual reproduction. But that's for another episode. The other form of the conidia is morphologically and physiologically distinct, as it's intended not for reproduction, but to support vegetative growth. This is the conidia anastomosis tube, the cat, which is generally smaller and unbranching. When the cats are formed in adjacent hyphaea, they begin to release some kind of pheromone or some kind of signaling mechanism. It's not quite understood. And as they do so, the tubes kind of recognize where each other, where each other are positioned in space, and they'll home in on each other. They'll engage in a homing behavior. They'll literally sense where the other tube is, and they'll grow towards it, 
eventually meeting and then fusing to form a cohesive singular tube connecting uh, two individual hyphaea. Now, even though this process isn't particularly well understood, studies have found that the genes and the signal conduction pathways used in this conidia anastomosis tube fusion are more or less the same that are used in the cell fusion of single-celled funguses like yeasts. Okay, now back to the hyphaea themselves. There are two types of these hyphaea, uh, generally two structural types. Uh, one is septate, and the other is cenocytic. Septate comes from the word septum, or the Latin word septa, which is an enclosing wall or barrier. So now, uh, septate hyphaea are multicellular, and they're typically only one cell wide. They're basically a single file thread of cells connected end to end. Each cell end connecting it to the adjacent cells is thus defined by a structure called a septa, which is an internal cell wall, or a plate, that runs perpendicular to the length of the hyphaea. This wall is part of a greater cell wall in the fungal cells, very similar to the cell wall in plants. Now both plants and fungal cell walls contain chemicals like glucans, which are polysaccharides that help give the cell wall its strength. However, fungal cell walls also have a material called chitin, which is a long-chain polymer composed of N-acetylglucosamine monomers. Now this is really interesting, because plants don't have chitin, but arthropods do. Insect and crustacean exoskeletons are packed with chitin, as are the scales of fish, and the scales on butterfly wings, and the beaks of squid and octopus. Anyway, these septa structures that divide the fungal cells are porous, so as to allow the relatively unobstructed flow of cellular stuff throughout the length of the hyphaea. This cellular stuff includes cytoplasm and absorbed nutrients, as well as the organelles that need to be moved around throughout the hyphaea, and even nuclei that need to get shuttled around between cells. Now the other kind of hyphaea are the cenocytic variety. These are really crazy, I think they're super wild, because they don't have septas dividing their cells. Cenocytic hyphaea are essentially long cellular tubes packed with all of the nuclei and the organelles of what would be their individual cells, except because there's no septas, there's no hard divisions between the cells, the cenocytic hyphaea are just massively long, multinucleated supercells. Cytoplasm, nutrients, organelles, and nuclei are all able to flow unrestricted throughout the entire length of the hyphaea, as if it's just a giant subway tract. Think of it like this. The cenocytic fungus growing in the soil right under your feet is like a living layer in the substrate, a single, massive, tangled supercell spreading out its millions of fibrous tentacles in what's called a mycelial wave front, expanding outwards in search of food. The accumulated growth of all of these mycelial wave fronts and their created fungal bodies accounts for something on the order of 30% of the organic content in the soil. Either living or dead, fungal tissue composes a huge portion of the soil, and according to the mycologist Paul Stamets, for every meter of tree root that penetrates the ground, there's a kilometer of mycelia. That's a ratio of a thousand to one. These facts should give some insight into just how extensive and ever-present fungus is, how thorough and endless its growth is, and how pervasive they are throughout the world's ecosystems. If you want to hear more from this world-famous mycologist, Paul Stamets, a great place to start would be his appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast, uh, episode 1035. It's a great way to spend two hours, because uh, that interview is as mind-blowing as it is information dense. If you're interested in fungus, you really should check it out. It takes what I provide here and just blows it out of the water, because this guy is the real deal. Anyway, I briefly mentioned uh, yeasts, which are single-celled fungi, as opposed to the, uh, to the filamentous hyphaea fungi. These are the two basic growth forms of fungus. You have the, the filamentous fibrous hyphaea, which are also called molds, and then you have the single-celled fungus, which are called yeasts. Because yeasts are single-celled, they don't have the complex, relatively large physical structures and networks 
that molds and other filamentous fungi have. Yeasts typically grow in patterns not dissimilar from bacteria, where they form thin mats covering whatever substrate it is that they're growing on. They grow essentially as powders or conglomerations of single cells, and they can grow in a huge variety of places, under a huge variety of conditions. Various species of yeast grow on the skin of animals, like the Trichosporon cutaneum and the Candida albicans, uh, which grows on human skin. There are yeasts that grow in water and marine environments. There are yeasts that grow in the guts of all kinds of animals, from mammals to insects, as part of the community of gut flora that participates in the digestion of food. Uh, much like bacteria, yeasts are these single-celled organisms that produce a huge variety of chemicals, everything from medicines to foods to poisons, which have an equally huge range of applications in human society. However, I'll talk a lot more about the numerous uses of yeasts in a later episode in this series that explores the relationship between humans and fungi. So mold is the filamentous fungi that I've been talking about for most of the episode so far. Molds can grow on dead or dying organic matter, using heterotrophic metabolic processes to break down that organic matter and absorb the nutrients to fuel their own growth. When mold grows on, for example, a piece of fruit, the fruit will visibly decay as the fungus consumes it for nutrients, and the mold itself will grow, and it will eventually become visible to the naked eye because it's like a, a giant massive colony of hyphaea. Even though the individual hyphaea fibers are microscopic and thus not visible, when molds grow to cover the outer surface of a fruit or some other kind of organic matter, this accumulated hyphal mass of the mycelium, it becomes very visible. Macroscopic mold growths can have a wide variety of morphologies, based on the species and the growth patterns of the fungus in question. Some molds look like small, dense clumps that grow and spread across the surface of a substrate. They might be white or brown or, or green. Other molds look really fuzzy, with tangled hyphaea forming larger ropes or braids that are visible to the naked eye as very thin strands or filaments. The various colors that define the species of mold come from the macroscopic effect of viewing, uh, of, of viewing pigments, or darkly colored spores. Each cell in the fungus might express a little bit of pigment, like melanin, to protect from UV radiation. And when you view this at a macroscopic level, these little bits of pigments all blur together to create green, blue, white, brown, and black, whatever hue that the fungus happens to be. Uh, and these are, these are kind of characteristic of the molds. It's also important to understand that when you're looking at a rotting vegetable, for example, and you see that it's got mold growing on it, that mold is one cohesive mycelial network. It's one individual fungus, even though it may appear to be composed of thousands of smaller strands or clumps. As the mycelial wavefront cascades across the substrate, across the surface of this vegetable or whatever it's eating, the cytoplasm and the organelles and the nuclei needed to support the fungus' growth and metabolism will generally flow towards this wavefront, towards the tips of the hyphaea, that are in contact with food, with stuff that can be digested and metabolized. This is where all of the action is, and it leaves behind the dried-out husks of older hyphal tissue that has absorbed all the nutrients around it. Just as the root of a vascular plant absorbs water and nutrients mostly near the tip, and this propels the root to perpetually dig and search through the soil for more nutrients and more water, the mycelia also absorbs water and nutrients mostly near the mycelial wavefront, uh, near the tips of its hyphaea. And so the bulk of the cellular structures and the cellular activity in the fungus takes place within the wavefront, within that growing edge of the hyphaea network. What gets left behind is the pseudo-skeletal structure of older hyphaea cells that no longer really engage in metabolic activity, because all the proximate nutrients have been absorbed and all the cytoplasm and other stuff has flowed outwards to where there are more nutrients, into the younger, more active hyphaea cells. In this way, the mold also searches for food, and grows in greater concentrations where it finds food. Where the fungus doesn't find food, it won't tend to grow very dense. It'll just move on through on its journey to find more food, to explore its environment. 
This growth pattern creates mycelia that are actually remarkably effective and efficient at spreading itself out between food sources. You know, it maximizes uh, the efficiency of resource use to resource acquisition. A famous example of this was an experiment conducted in late 2009 and the study published in early 2010, uh, studying a yellow slime mold called Physarum polycephalum. Now, slime molds, like the one they studied in the study, are technically not true fungi. They're fungus-like organisms classified as protists, but their growth patterns are really similar to the true fungi. The yellow slime mold in question is much like a cenocytic fungus, in that it's essentially a giant multinucleated supercell. In the wild, the slime molds explore their habitat by sending out an expanding circular wave of tissue in the form of a mesh of extremely fine hyphaea analogs, and this is kind of like the mycelial wave front. And uh, so as this expands out, uh, through the course of its exploration, it'll come into contact with sources of food. Now, it'll build up tissue where the food is, and it will create vascular structures, or tubes, connecting the food source to the rest of the slime mold, so as to shuttle nutrients back and forth. If you see this yellow slime mold in the wild, it might look like some kind of crazy yellow alien vascular system creeping across a dead fallen tree. The mature, refined growth form looks like a thick mass of yellow veins. It's super cool, and it's super creepy. Anyway, researchers at the Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan, created a map of the Tokyo supermetropolis, and they put 35 little nodes of food, in this case a bunch of oat flakes, around a little miniaturized map where smaller towns and suburbs are located in relation to the Tokyo city proper. They even had a little coastline on their map that acted as a border to the slime mold's growth. The P. polycephalum slime mold was then placed at the center of the node that represented the heart of Tokyo, and it was allowed to grow across this little mini-map to explore its environment and find all of the little oat flakes that the researchers had left out for it. Over the course of several hours, the slime mold analog to a mycelial wave front was expanding outwards from its origin, covering the map in a relatively dense mat of tissue. Where it found an oat flake, the mold tissue would concentrate its growth. It would encapsulate the oat flake and begin consuming it. While the nearest oat flakes got covered and were slowly consumed, the wave front continued to expand, its density generally decreasing as it spread out across a larger and larger area. As the wave front expanded and explored outwards, it would run into more and more oat flakes, and it would encapsulate them to make more food-absorbing nodes. After five hours of growth, it had covered the seven nearest oat flakes. After eight hours, it had reached 13 oat flakes. After 11 hours, 23. After 16 hours, 32. By 26 hours in, the slime mold had reached every node and had fully explored the minimap. It was in these later hours of growth where the really interesting stuff started to happen. As the wavefront expanded farther and farther out into the countryside, so to speak, the tissue in the areas that it had already explored began to recede. The slime mold retracted from areas where there wasn't any food, which were areas on the map with no towns or major suburbs, you know, no oat flakes. Its tissue was actually concentrated on the oat flakes themselves. However, this retraction of tissue didn't cut off the nodes from one another. Instead, the slime mold retained a single tube structure, like a massive vein or a subway train, connecting one node to another. When the slime mold had expanded to fill the entire map, and it had nowhere else to explore, the receding tissue created a refined network of tubes connecting all of these little oat flakes, and thus all of the little nodes of metabolically active slime mold tissue. Inefficient tubes that were too long or too out of the way also receded, leaving behind only the strongest, most efficiently positioned tubes. What the slime mold had created in a single day was a nearly perfect recreation of the Tokyo subway system that had taken hundreds of professional engineers weeks and months to design. The slime mold's network of nutrient-sharing tubes was just as efficient, just as effective, and in some cases, even more so. 
Without a brain or eyes, the slime mold was able to create a transport network to shuttle nutrients that surpassed the skill of some of the world's best engineers. If that's not the coolest thing ever, I don't know what cool is. Now, I know this slime mold isn't technically a true fungus, but the general growth patterns that I've described here are the same. Fungal molds will extend their hyphaea in this mycelial wave front in the search for food, and when they find it, they'll build up their tissue there to maximize the breakdown and absorption of nutrients. Where there's no nutrients, or where there's no food, or where all of the available nutrients have already been consumed, the hyphaea networks will recede and die back. In this way, the slime mold, and pretty much all fungal molds, grow like a dynamic mesh network, reinforcing growth where the nutrients can support it, and dying off and receding where they can't. As long as the fungus can continue to find food, it can continue to shuttle nutrients throughout its entire body and stay alive, and it can continue growing to cover a massive area. The largest fungus ever discovered is an individual of the honey fungus species Armillaria ostoyea, which exists in the Malheur National Forest in eastern Oregon, in the northwestern corner of the contiguous United States. This specimen is believed to be something like 2,400 years old, 24 centuries, and it covers a whopping 8.9 square kilometers, or 2,200 acres, which is an area greater than 660 football fields. Despite its relatively sweet-sounding name, this honey fungus is parasitic of plants with woody tissue, like trees. As the massive, ancient honey fungus of Oregon is situated in the Malheur National Forest, it has no shortage of trees and other woody plants to kill and saprophytically consume. It does this with what's called white rot, or root rot, where it infects roots and strangles the host by depriving it of the nutrients it gets from the soil, which then slowly kills the host. This is fine for the fungus, as it can then feed off of the dead plant tissue, and it grows its fruiting bodies, its mushrooms, out of the side of the tree. These fruiting bodies of the fungus, uh, or the sporocarp, are perhaps the most visible aspect of their physiology, due in part to their macroscopic size and their typically bright, sometimes vivid, coloration. These fruiting bodies are relatively dense collections of tightly interwoven tangled hyphaea, which creates a soft, but somewhat solid, macroscopic structures that are used for releasing huge amounts of spores. The most common fruiting body that you might be familiar with, uh, that you might recognize, is the mushroom. The mushroom is what's called an epigeous fruiting body, or one that grows above the ground. In contrast, there are hypogeous fruiting bodies, which grow below the ground surface. These hypogeous funguses are typically called truffles. These truffles usually grow in a symbiotic relationship with the roots of trees, where they attract animals who come by and eat them by picking them up out of the ground and physically destroying them through chewing and consumption, which ends up uh, mechanically breaking open their spore sacs and releasing all the spores everywhere. This method of spore dispersal is relatively barbaric, as it's literally just brute mechanical forces, like shaking and crushing and tearing, which release the spores and throw them all over the place. The epigeous fruiting bodies, on the other hand, have a somewhat more sophisticated method of spore dispersal. Sometimes they can use water, as in the case of marine-based or hydrophilic fungi. They can use air, where the spores are simply released to drop into the ground or uh, catch on, onto the wind. And they can also take advantage of the simple mechanical dispersal forces that truffles use, uh, just through basic animal interference. The structures of these epigeous sporocarps vary wildly from species to species, which makes the observation and the study of the sporocarp an effective way to identify species. For example, there's a, a recently emerged uh, but relatively large lineage of fungi called the Ascomycetes, or the sac fungi which produce sporocarps called ascocarps. These typically take the form of some kind of bag or sac shape, where the spore-producing structures line the inside of the sac. 
Some subtypes of these include apothecium structures, which are like saucers or bowls held up on a stalk coming out of the ground. There are the parathecium, which are small little flask-shaped structures with a single little pore at the top, through which the spores are released. One of the cooler structures are the cleistothecium, which are globular structures with an outer layer that's uh, defined by these uh, large dots of irregular pits and folds. They look weirdly alien and creepy, and as I sit here looking at pictures of them, I'm finding them very difficult to describe. There's another major clade of fungus called the Basidiomycetes, which grows fruiting bodies in the more traditional mushroom shape, which is called an agaric growth form. This agaric fruiting body has a cap resting on a stalk, with the underside of the cap defined by gills, or tubes, or pores, or some other kind of spore-releasing structure. Other types of Basidiomycetes fruiting bodies include polypores, which grow off of the sides of trees in the form of a half-cap, or kind of like a fan shape. These are also called conchs, bracket fungi, or shelf fungi, as they make what appears to be little organic shelves that small animals like insects can walk upon. Then there are the cicodioid fungi, which have uh, epigeous sporocarps that look like small balloons or irregular lobes. Gastroid fungi have a similarly shaped fruiting body, but these lobes, or spheres, are raised up on little stalks, whereas the cicodioid fruiting bodies are just blobs that are sitting right on the ground. Some of these gastroid fungi include puffballs, which are the fungi that produce spores inside an internal structure that can be popped, that releases the spores in a little mini-explosion, aided in part by the forceful release of internal gases. This is what gives them their puffing quality and their puffball name. As a child, I can remember uh, playing around outside, finding and stepping on all kinds of puffball mushrooms, and a lot of them would release a, a little cloud of stinky green gas along with their spores. A little giggling six-year-old me thought that that was a plant fart. You know, I didn't know it was a fungi, I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was hilarious. I'd find these little puffballs, and I'd stomp on everyone that I could, sending up little stinky green poofs of spores. Now that I look back on it, I kind of wonder if my childish antics helped spread their spores and sustain their populations. Anyway, there are numerous kinds of fruiting bodies that I haven't described, as describing them all would take a really long time. As these structures are typically involved in the sexual reproduction of fungus, I'll talk more about them in much greater detail in the upcoming episode on fungal reproduction. As for fungal development and physiology, I think I've covered a decent amount of material, so I'll wrap it up here. This was a fun and interesting episode for me to write and to record, but it was also challenging, as fungi are deceptively complex and incredibly diverse. The world of fungi is enigmatic and awe-inspiring as fungus play a critical role in maintaining and perpetuating our ecosystems. They are the consumers of detritus, recycling nutrients from dead organic mass and bringing them back into the greater ecosystem. They are the symbiotes of vascular plants, sustaining them with critical nutrients that the plants struggle to get on their own. They are the unseen gardeners of the shady underworld of life, keeping the biosphere going from their hidden position within the damp, dark recesses of the world. Join me next week as I explore the hydration and nutrition of fungus, and how they break down detritus to recycle nutrients back into the ecosystem to help keep life going. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 